Over 130 years ago, there was an enormous wooden structure across what we know today as Keyser Avenue in Old Forge, Pennsylvania. This building, known as the Sibley Breaker, perished twice in fire, and yet it is still remembered to this day, even over 100 years after its destruction. Now at this point you might be asking yourself, what was the purpose of such a bizarre building? And there were many like it throughout Pennsylvania. So stay tuned for the answer. This is the story of the Sibley Breakers. I'm your host Ryan Sokesh and you're watching It's History. First constructed in 1873, the Sibley Breaker's function was to break coal into pieces, sort them by size, remove any impurities from the product, and grade the coal on remaining impurities. Coal breakers typically were as close to the mine entrance as possible to minimize travel time. The colliery, which is a coal mine and all the buildings that served it, had a special underground tunnel to connect the Sibley Works to the Old Forge coal shaft, making the trip a uniquely short one. Perhaps it is due to this that the Sibley Works processed 5,260,855 tons of coal between 1873 and 1916. Before entering the breakers, workers crushed coal, sorted out smaller pieces, placed them into mine carts, and washed it with water if necessary. Since coal often exited the mines with other materials like slate, sulfur, ash, clay, or soil, a more thorough cleaning is required than a spray of water can do. That is where the breaker came in. The earliest coal breakers first appeared in the mid-1840s, typically oriented towards the mine's opening so that the coal fell into the breaker. When that was not possible, breakers had lifts that carried the coal up to the top of the line. The Sibley breaker had a cage hoist built into the structure, allowing the raw coal to travel directly to the top. Its tallest point, in fact, were the pulleys that made the lift work. Boilers or engines housed nearby provided power to operate that lift. When not built on a slope, breakers typically reached eight or nine stories in height. The typical breaker's first point was an inclined picker table, where coal entered from the lift or mine, and employees picked out obvious impurities, like rocks or slate chunks. These pieces went down comb pipes to workers' sides, where the debris joined the combs, which was a mixture of coal too small for use, impurities, and of course debris. The workers also took out lumps of clean coal and deposited it down a separate clean coal pipe, which had it skip the rest of the line and go straight to crushing. The second level was far rougher sorting. Here, coal passed over sorting bars, which shifted through the coal and sorted it into its desired types. Each type passed over a mud screen with round coal passed through into the next area. A flat slate fell into a comb pile. From there, the coal passed through more screens, some of which shook, shifting out impurities and sorting the coal more accurately. Other screens were cylindrical and in 10 rotations a minute, they performed the same duty as the others. Thirdly, there was a crushing level with most of the coal still being lumps at this point, crushing was necessary to make them fit for marketing. Two cylinders, one with teeth, another with holes to accept the teeth, crushed the lump of coal into smaller and smaller sizes. In the fourth level, another line of pickers removed impurities and picked out good coal for the coal mine. While workers picked out impurities at all levels, this level had the most by far. Coal picked out at the beginning of the line rejoins here, since at this point the line had lost much of the incline. The coal traveled through this layer on conveyor belts typically 33 feet per minute for smaller coal sizes and 50 feet per minute for larger. At the ground level, coal and culm reached the end point. Dry culm went away to a nearby dump. Wet culm stayed in holding tanks until dry, and clean processed coal was collected by rail cars and went straight to market. Since these were the days before child labor laws, boys typically between the ages of 8 and 12 
took to removing impurities in the coal by hand and placing them into chutes at their side, and there were rarely any safety protocols in place either. The interiors of these breaker buildings were extremely dangerous. There were even hazards in the air, as coal dust led to asthma and black lung disease. To handle the potentially slick rocks better, so-called breaker boys went without gloves, despite the sharpness of the stones. Most finished their 10-hour shifts with countless bleeding cuts, and those were the lucky ones. Some were unfortunate enough to lose a finger on the conveyor belts, and others lost entire limbs to gears in the machinery. The least fortunate breaker boys fell into the machinery, crushed to death and only retrieved at the end of the day. Others got caught by the rushing coal and suffocated in a pile. Thankfully, Pennsylvania was quicker on the draw than most and outlawed children under 12 working in coal breakers in 1885. Unfortunately, enforcement of this law was rare as employees and families frequently forged birth certificates to allow their children to work. As technology advanced in the 20th century, breaker boys became progressively more outdated and unnecessary, eventually ending for the most part by 1920 thanks to the efforts of the National Child Labor Committee and the National Consumer League. On February the 5th, 1886, a fire broke out within the breaker, completely destroying the building. The A.B. Terrell Company wasted no time in reconstructing it, as they entirely cleaned the site by July the 5th, and rebuilding was already underway. The second structure was similar to the first, maintaining many of the original's features. However, it was also not to be. Within 20 years, the site had cleared again. On June the 23rd, 1906, at 10.45 a.m., another fire broke out within the breaker. This blaze not only claimed the breaker, but the engine house, boiler, and supply house. Over the course of its operating years, 43 workers lost their life in the Sibley Colliery. Many coal breakers around Pennsylvania still stand today, and while operations have primarily moved elsewhere, they remain uniquely Pennsylvanian. For the most part, coal breakers like this were only ever found in the anthracite coal mines of Pennsylvania. The large wooden structures strike an imposing figure over the towns they called home, just as the shadows of the coal industry loom over the state.